Just to start here, uh, would you tell me your name, uh, how long you served on the force, and what divisions you served in? Uh, my name is Cheryl Dorsey. I joined the Los Angeles Police Department in 1980. I was first assigned to Southwest Division, Central Division, Central Traffic Division, Operation South Bureau Crash, which is Community Resources Against Street Hoodlums, Pacific Division, Newton Division, North Hollywood Division, Back to Newton Division, Central Division as a Detective Sergeant, and I retired in August of 2000. Terrific. So from what you can tell, in your opinion, based on the very limited information we have from the LAPD, uh, what do you make of the officer's engagement with Ford uh, and this so-called investigative stop? Uh, the vague justification for what happened, uh, the hint that they say suspicious hand gestures, uh, a scuffle, reaching for the officer's gun, all of which eyewitnesses refute. Uh, what does all this mean? What it means to me is that the Los Angeles Police Department is now circling the wagons and they're trying to come up with that probable cause that didn't exist for that encounter that they had with Ezell Ford. I believe that the officers probably know Ezell from the neighborhood because the gang officers work the same area, they encounter the same people as I did when I was assigned to gangs, and I believe that there was probably a history. And I think that when the officer stopped Ezell to have a conversation with him and he didn't comply, that they made a decision that they were going to get physical with him. And I like to refer to that as contempt of cop. Officer gives you an order, you don't obey, then there's a penalty, and it's usually a physical penalty. And so what concerns me is that absent that probable cause for the initial detention, everything that happened after that is problematic for the police department. Citizens have an absolute right if the encounter with the police officer is consensual to disengage at any moment. If I'm not under arrest, if I haven't been suspected of criminal activity, if there's no crime in the area that I am related to, then I get to go. And so to say that Ezell was acting suspicious is so vague. What does that mean? Did he look suspicious? Was he walking suspicious? What does that mean? The LAPD has said that Ford reached for one of the officer's weapons, so therefore they had to fire upon him. Uh, some witnesses have said that he was lying on the ground, he was shot in the back. Uh, for, for this question, let's, let's give the police the benefit of the doubt here. Say Ezell did reach for the gun, uh, the officers had to protect themselves. But didn't the officers put this mentally ill man in this position? It feels like a self-fulfilling kind of prophecy and feels unfair. Obviously Ford didn't have to reach for the weapon, no one forced him to, if in fact he did. But are officers trained to deal with the situations, especially uh, with a mentally ill person uh, like Ford allegedly is in other ways? Well, you know, officers are taught to escalate and de-escalate in the use of force. And so you can only use that force that's reasonable to overcome a suspect's resistance. And officers are also taught to articulate what may have caused them to escalate that force. And, you know, we've heard time and time again that an officer will say that, in my mind, I was fearful. Uh, in my mind, I feared for my own safety, and therefore that seems to justify this thing that is really unjustifiable. And so I'm not convinced that Ezell reached for the officer's gun. You know, I saw something recently on the news where officers were fighting with a, a gentleman on a traffic stop, and the whole time the officer was yelling, quit going for my gun, quit going for my gun. And the video, fortunately for that young man, showed that there was no attempt to go for the officer's gun. So I'm not so sure that we have a situation where deadly force was really needed. There were certainly other options that the officers could have used. They could have used mace. They could have used um, strikes with their baton. But they chose to jump right to deadly force, and so I'm, I'm troubled by that. How about these statements from the community? from Ford's family, uh, that the mental illness was well known by the force, uh, and that these officers that interacted with him specifically uh, knew that. How likely is that? Uh, is that a part of community policing in your understanding? I believe it's very po probable that they knew that this young man had mental issues. Again, if this is their area, it's a small area, they routinely patrol it eight hours a day, you see the same people over and over. And so you get to know who has an issue, and you get to know who's the bad guy, who's cutting up on a regular basis. 
So I think that it's very possible and it's very provable because officers many times document their encounters with the citizens either in an FI card, field identification card, or in their uh, daily log where they will write down the name of someone that they may have spoken to in the course of a day. And so I think it's very provable to, to be able to substantiate whether or not these officers knew Ezel and had a relationship. So uh, in my conversation with members of the community, um, they told me that officers involved in the shooting of Ford had uh, quote unquote uh, messed with him a number of occasions prior to the August 11th shooting and killing of him. Uh, a man that lives in, uh, in this neighborhood uh, told me that the day before they were harassing him, uh, essentially taunting him. Um, how likely does this sound to you? Does this sound like behavior you, you witnessed yourself uh, from fellow officers while you were on the force? Well, I believe that it's possible, certainly, because again, the officers work this area. We're assigned to an area and we're in it for eight hours every day. And maybe there was something that occurred the day before or days before where the officers had a beef with Ezel, let's say, and they couldn't really deal with him on that day. But knowing he'll be out on Tuesday, Wednesday, I'll see you again and I'll deal with you then. It, it very probably could have been that. Now that's not to say wholesale officers do that, but you know, if you have an officer, and typically the ones that are assigned to the gang detail are you know, what I like to refer to as Uber officers. You know, they have aspirations of going to metropolitan division or other specialized units, and sometimes they want to make a name for themselves, and they do it at the expense of the public. And I just hope that that wasn't the case with these L. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about the, the gang division uh, and your experience of it. Um, are, are, they, are they more or, like, or less likely to use deadly force uh, or brutal force? To, uh, do they assume certain things about community members more than, than say, other divisions uh, to escalate something to this level? Um, can, you, can you speak on any of this, given your experience? I don't know that I want to necessarily blanket a gang officer with someone who's more likely to use deadly force, but I think when you have officers in a community and you deal with that 10% that's always causing trouble, you tend to want to paint everybody with that same broad brush and you want to assume that, or officers sometimes wrongly assume that everyone that they deal with is either on parole or probation, you just got out of jail or you're involved in some kind of criminal activity. I think when you lose your humanity, it's easy to objectify someone and it's easy to treat them in a manner that you wouldn't want that person, if they were an officer, to treat your family. And so I think officers have to really struggle to be fair. Um, you can take a person to jail and take them with their dignity. And I think sometimes that officers lose sight of that. So, uh, you know, as a community, uh, as part of Los Angeles, all of us uh, want to believe our police officers when they say things like Ford reached for a weapon or whatever they say to justify uh, their actions. Uh, but in your experience, do police occasionally justify the use of deadly force uh, by more or less uh, trumping up reasons after the fact in the reporting of the incident. We've certainly seen examples of that. Very recently there was an LAPD officer in Van Nuys Jail Division who assaulted a female in lockup. Read his arrest report and it painted a very different picture once the video was released. So we know that that can happen. And I understand that community and jurors and uh, people in positions of authority give great deference to police officers because we want to believe that our police officers are honest. And so when an officer says a thing, you want to believe that. And it's only and until we have evidence to the contrary that it gives us pause and it really paints the officers who are doing their job right in a bad light. And now it makes it difficult for everyone to believe anything an officer says because of one or two bad apples. What about uh, the security hold on uh, Ezel Ford's autopsy report uh, and the names of the police officers? Uh, what's the reasoning behind doing that? Uh, Becca said, of, of course, you know, it's an ongoing investigation. Uh, and the, would the community, uh, along with that, uh, would the community benefit from a more transparent police department that would release that information in a quicker manner? Well, you know, Chief Beck is amazing when it comes to double talk, code talk. And so when he says that um, he has safety concerns for the officer. I mean, that makes sense to a, an extent. I, I'm, I'm not so certain that I think the officer's names should be released because they have family members and you wouldn't want someone who feels a certain way about this incident 
to act in a way that would be inappropriate and may cause harm to that officer's family or to that officer. But at the same time, in terms of the autopsy report, it is what it is. And the facts are the facts. And so why not share that with the public and with the family who has a right to know? Um, those things are unchangeable. And I think when you are saying that you are refusing to release that information because of some other concern, I, I think it becomes disingenuous and it becomes hard to believe. What about, uh, what about racism in the LAPD? Uh, one of the community members that I spoke to described what happened uh, here with Ezell Ford as racial bullshit, uh, as part of what the core of what happened to Ford. Um, can you speak to any of that? How much does racism infect the behavior of LAPD officers, especially in neighborhoods like this one that are predominantly black? Well, understand that officers come from society, and so when they come to work in a certain community, they come with biases. That's not to say that everyone has a bias, but I think when you deal with a person on a regular basis, you start, uh, as a citizen, you start to feel like maybe you're a little hard on me because of what I look like and because of who I am. If you work South Central LA, you're going to encounter blacks and Hispanics because that's who's down here. And so I don't know these officers' heart. I can't speak to that. And I don't believe wholesale that the department is racist, but I do know that there are racists on the Los Angeles Police Department. What Sorry. needs to be reformed in the LAPD, in your opinion, to avoid other situations like this? I think it would be important if the officers received training. I think it would be important if the officers received a psychological evaluation every three years to make sure that they aren't tainted by the things that they witness on a day-to-day -day basis when dealing with the public. It would be important to have training dealing with mental illness. And I think unless and until the police chief admits that the department has a problem, we won't see those changes because if you don't have a problem, there's really nothing to change. And so it's okay to admit that we don't always get it right. We don't, we're human. And so if we acknowledge that, then let's take some affirmative steps to make sure that there's never another Ezell Ford. Make sure that their officers understand that they have a duty to discharge their activities in a way that's respectful, that's dignified, and within the spirit of the law, not necessarily the letter of the law. Where do officers learn this kind of behavior that you speak about, this sort of uh, justification after the fact when, when building a report about an incident like this? Is this, a, is this systemic? Is it something that's cultural within uh, LAPD? Is it a broader problem? Is it something that's learned at the academy? What, what, what would you say about that? Well, it's certainly something that's learned on a subconscious level. It's systemic and it's cultural. And what happens is, is if you have an officer who's overzealous and he's a training officer and you're a young, impressionable police officer, when you're under his charge, you want to please that officer. And so you're going to start to adapt and comport yourself in a way that you see seems to work for this officer, in a way that will get you that good rating, in a way that will make sure you get off probation, and then it just becomes uh, uh, kind of a repeat situation because now you promote and you're a training officer and then you teach those same bad habits, those same bad thoughts to the next person, the next officer that you work with. And so I think the department, like I said, they need to admit that there's a problem and then it needs to start from the top down because the people that are in positions of authority on the department have grown up in this system. And so they've grown up doing it, they've grown up seeing it, and they've grown up acquiescing to it. And so the change needs to come from the top down. When you were an officer, were you ever witnessed, were you ever with a group of cops that wound up using uh, deadly force, wound up using uh, a, a brutal force in, in a beating? Um, if so, uh, I'd love for you to speak on it. Uh, if not, I'd love for you to speak on, uh, and, and either way actually, what, 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 what's the peer pressure like to engage in brutality uh, and or to help cover it up? I think what happens, I think officers wind up in a, in, a, in a pack mentality, almost like a pack of dogs. You know, you see it at the end of a vehicle pursuit, everybody's amped up, adrenaline is running, and one person acts in a bad way and the others just get tunnel vision. And so if you don't have a strong individual, if you don't have someone who's not fearful of retribution, not fearful of retaliation, or not fearful of being ostracized, because that's a real thing on the department, then you don't say anything, you go along to get along. I never witnessed anyone being brutal, brutally attacked. I never was involved in a deadly force incident. And I think you also have to consider what happens when testosterone is involved, because the way that I react 
to a situation because I'm a female is going to be very different from the way a male officer might react. And so when you have two men, two combatants who could really do harm, it takes on a different dynamic. When, when I, as a female officer, approaches a male suspect, he already knows, he sized me up. I'm a girl. I can only do so much. But when it's man on man, and a male looks at a male officer, he thinks, I could probably take him. And that male officer is like, I could probably take him. And so then you wind up having a test of wills. And so I think that's where humanity comes in. That's where compassion comes in. That's where this could be my son. So let me talk to you. Let me, let me say something compelling to you. Let me tell you why you want to comply with my orders. Because at the end of the day, the public needs to understand this is a situation that you will not win. And you're not going to resolve it on the streets. And so sometimes it's better for a citizen to just allow that officer to do that thing, even though it may not be the right thing, and then handle it more appropriately later when cooler heads prevail. That's interesting. So, so my last question is kind of advice for, for young men and women out on the streets. Uh, how, how do they deal with officers, uh, some well-intended, some not, uh, when confronted in situ by situations like this where, uh, especially in situations where they are innocent, but also in terms when they're not, but uh, especially an innocent person minding their own business, suddenly being confronted with a, a, an officer who appears to be getting more and more hostile. What should they do? The best advice that I can give anyone is to be a good witness for yourself. Be observant, pay particular attention to the officer's name, his badge number, the numbers on his car, and you don't have to telegraph that you're going to make a complaint because sometimes that can bring undue attention to you. You don't have to telegraph that. You just make a mental note. You just be a good witness and then you document it in writing and then you send it to everyone in his chain of command and hopefully something will be done. And understand that maybe in your case nothing will be done, but at least you've created a paper trail. And so sometimes when officers are involved in incidents later down the road, people in a position of authority, supervisors can say, wait a minute, this guy's been involved in two or three, what we call a mouth beef, mouth beef where you are verbally abusive or a physical altercation. And so then a supervisor will say, well, maybe where there's smoke, there's fire. And so it's always in your best interest to just be a good witness for yourself, handle it later. When cooler heads prevail, you'll go home alive. You may not go home happy, but you'll live another day.